Hello, my name is Tamo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team at a company called Weaveworks. Uh, we are very lucky today to have Paul Curtis, who's a solutions architect, also at Weaveworks. And he'll be talking about um, machine learning ops, ML ops, uh, and how you might apply GitOps and the concepts of like Canary and Blue Green and A-B testing, uh, which has now become under the umbrella term progressive delivery, um, how you can apply these concepts to machine, machine learning ops and specific needs for um, if you do machine learning or your internal customers do machine learning. So we're very excited about that. And um, before we get started, I'll do just a little bit of intro of what our background is. Uh, so I mentioned that Paul and I uh, and Stacy here, our community manager who organized this, uh, work for a company called Weaveworks. If this is your first time here, welcome. Thanks for joining. Uh, this is part of our Weave online user group weekly series, uh, where usually every Tuesday we have talks and we'll show you the meetup page where we have all the listings. Uh, today is a special edition on a Wednesday because uh, we're very excited to share with you um, the way that we apply some of the terms that you might have heard of up till now, like get and as I mentioned, progressive delivery to specific risks um, around machine learning ops. Um, we're a company that's based in San Francisco, London, Berlin, New York, Colorado, and with distributed teams. Uh, and uh, if you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CEO, CTO, and some of our engineers come from RabbitMQ. They're the people who created the technology RabbitMQ and the company and sold it to VMware. Uh, and then they noticed uh, needs in the container and the growing Kubernetes space and through some open source projects and ultimately products, they created this company, Weaveworks. Um, we're VC funded by Axel Partners and other uh, VCs, uh, but one I will mention is also we are funded by Google Ventures, uh, which is sort of relevant to our dedicated work in the Kubernetes space. Uh, a lot of what we do is founded on open source. Uh, some of you may know about WeaveNet. That was probably one of our first, if first um, projects that still today is one of the premier ways of networking your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we also have Cortex that you might know, which has been in the CNCF for a while now. Uh, and that is built on Prometheus and makes it scalable as well as um, adds capabilities to that as well. Uh, we also have Flux that recently joined the CNCF as a sandbox project, um, and that helps you with automated deployments, both with apps and with um, your Kubernetes environments. Uh, and that's really kind of the technology that triggered this term GitOps that you might have um, heard at this point. It's become pretty pervasive. Uh, so it's sort of the technology that led us there. Uh, we have many others, like we've had Weave Scope for a while, and Weave Flagger is one of our most recent ones. Uh, and that's the one that like, helps automate and, and leverage Prometheus uh, and other uh, metrics to set up your um, quote unquote progressive delivery or your canary or your blue green or your um, you know AB uh, rerouting of traffic. Um, so that's based on service meshes like Istio, but um, currently also has other alternatives. So these are a lot of the projects that have really been um, taking fire and have come from this company. We also do have paid products. Uh, we have Weave Cloud, uh, which at this point now is over three years. Uh, it's a SaaS product that helps you manage, monitor, and do automated deployments for your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, in some ways, so the open source technologies that I mentioned, it's sort of a hosted version of that. So especially if you want something like Prometheus, but you don't want to install it, maintain it, and all that, um, it offers that and then has more integrated enterprise level um, uh, qualities where, for example, with Flux, and actually we should mention um, Flagger, you can leverage your Prometheus metrics to automate how you want to um, do your automated deployments or do your progressive delivery. Um, so we've had that, like I said, now at this point, about four years of running Weave Cloud in production on Kubernetes on AWS. And so as we've been selling Weave Cloud, a lot of people have been asking us, oh, you know, this is great, but we also need help on our Kubernetes journey. And how unique is it that you guys have, you know, four years of running Kubernetes in production? So we're in the process right now of productizing the distribution layer that we created for Weave Cloud um, as an enterprise product. And as I mentioned again, with all the GitOps uh, fury that's been going around. We're also making it a very GitOps aware um, platform. 
So if you're interested in that, um, you can come talk to us. And of course, since we do have all these years of experience, um, people have been asking for consulting and training and support. So we do package those up together. So if you're interested in any or all of those, um, you can reach out to us in the, e uh, in the email that we'll be sending out to you after this event. So if this is your first time here, like I said, welcome. Thanks for joining. Hopefully you'll come to our other talks in the series. Our website is weave.works, so check it out and uh, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. So a little bit of housekeeping here. As I mentioned, um, I'm Tom O, and we're lucky to, hear, to, um, to have Paul Curtis from New York in our New York office, um, who will be talking about these concepts, um, but specifically on how you think about it from machine learning operations. Um, if you've been here before, you know that these uh, can be as short as about 30 minutes, uh, but generally, are about 45, um, especially after Q&A and all that. Um, if there are burning questions and we keep going, uh, we do allow going over 45, but we have an absolute hard stop at 60. Uh, but generally, these are about 45 minutes long. The platform that we're using is Zoom, uh, and the way to ask questions is through the chat box. So please make sure you type your questions, um, and please make sure you also type to everyone so that everyone can see your questions, and that way sometimes somebody in the group might even answer your question, and uh, so make sure you choose that as well so people can see your answers. Uh, if you're having trouble finding the chat box, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode and lets you see the fuller capabilities of Zoom, so hopefully you can find that. Um, and Paul, I should ask, do you like questions throughout or do you like questions at the end? Uh, let's do questions throughout. Throughout, excellent. Um, so I'll be monitoring the chat box and I'll like kind of give you a wave if there's a good moment where there's a pause and uh, let you know that there's some questions. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Paul. So let me know if you need me to stop sharing or if you can just take over. I think I need you to stop sharing. Okay, we'll do. Sharing. In which case, I can do that. Perfect. So I assume everybody can see? Yes? Yep. Okay. So as Tamao said, I'm Paul Curtis. I'm based here in New York City. Um, and I'm dealing with the customers as a solution architect. And so we get a lot of opportunity to talk to different customers and what they're using. But today I'm going to basically run through using the GitOps tools in a very specific use case surrounding machine learning. So as we go through this, I'm going to do two quick overviews. All right. My assumption is everybody knows Kubernetes and containers, but not everybody knows what a service mesh is. So I just want to touch on that. A service mesh is a layer in your Kubernetes cut, uh, cluster, a network layer, that allows you to control how pods are interconnected and how ingresses are connected. So in this world, it is a control plane for the Kubernetes network. And it allows you to do a lot of things that go beyond just you know, connecting this pod to that pod. So load balancing, traffic shifting, dynamic uh, AB, all kinds of things that you can uh, some examples of these are things like Istio and Envoy, Linkerd, uh, in uh, the hosted services, um, AppMesh, for example, in EKS would be a good example of that. The other thing that you kind of have to know about is progressive delivery. So the idea here is, is that in the old days when you had a new release of anything, you just kind of go, hmm, okay, and we'll just switch it over and we'll hope for the best. Uh, DevOps brought in a lot of things that made it a lot better. The first one was is that it typically has a built-in testing suite. So you actually test the code before you actually release it. That's even better. Most big release companies do things like UAT and staging so that they actually run them through at production levels. But even with all of that testing, there's nothing like running your application in the real world. But it's a high risk situation where you don't want to just say, okay, let's go, Frankenstein switch, you know, it's alive. No, what you want to do is progressively add traffic to the new release and subtract traffic from the old release over time and then watch the behavior. And if for whatever reason something goes bad, 
you can roll backwards seamlessly without having to like hit the Frankenstein switch again. So in the machine learning world, this is used when you're deploying new models. So we'll use a recommendation engine as an idea. So recommendation, right? You go to Amazon, it says, hi, you bought this. People who bought this also bought these things. Okay, so that's a recommendation. In a production environment, that means that it has to watch what you look at and then give recommendations of things that other people like you also bought. That has to happen in milliseconds. Okay, so, and it can be hundreds of thousands of these requests for that model to respond. So, and different people have different uh, buying habits and different people bought different things. So you can imagine how complex this gets very quickly. Now, in machine learning as well, we have some very basic premise on how this works. So GitOps as a methodology allows us to do a couple of things. First off, we can know exactly what was deployed and when. So in the data science world, you have data, you have models, you have training models, you have code. Okay, all of which is combined to make up the machine learning model that you're going to deploy. It's a lot of things. Pretty much everybody's using a source code repository to control this so that you can version it. In addition, in some industries, you have to have this. A good example, a stock trading algorithm has to be able to prove to the regulators what trading model was in use at the time that it, you know, sank the market. Okay, that kind of thing. But observability and auditability are critical in any of these data science projects, whether it be machine learning for risk analysis in the finance world or, you know, recommending a red candle to somebody who bought a red candle holder. So what's a machine learning pipeline look like? So basically, you have some data over here on the left. You have a model or an algorithm, and you put them together, and you try them out, and you look at the results, and then you iterate over and over and over again until you find the combination of algorithm and your test data set that produces what you want. So for example, in recommendations, you want to pick the right algorithm on a sample data set that says, ah, he bought a red candle holder. I want to give him a red candle. I don't want to give him a blue cow. So you do this for a while. Now, when you get to the end of this and you choose your algorithm and model, what ends up happening is you're going to have a couple of different things. You're going to have some code. You're going to have a model. You're going to have a training set. And you're going to have a data set. And those things all have to be done such that they can be isolated and then released. So when you look at it from a GitOps perspective, in our world, you have the data coming from a data engineer, and that's your training sets. You have the data scientist who's writing the algorithms. They're both checking these things into Git. And we can use Flux to deploy them and then test them. So a very simple mechanism for a data scientist is to say, okay, this model's ready to go. I'm going to commit it and push it into Git, and Flux can pick that up, that new code, and run it. Now, typically, a model is not only an algorithm and code, but it's a data set as well. So the data engineer has to make sure that the newer data set is available. They can iterate this, as I showed in the last diagram, very quickly. So he runs his tests and they come back bad. He changes the algorithm, does a git commit and push, and he'll hit it again almost immediately. And you can do this very, very quickly. But when you get to the end of that, okay, that's pre-production. We haven't really done anything. Why are we talking about that? Because the same process and the same methodology works for production level models and code as well. Because if everything is in Git, okay, whether that's code models, even Kubernetes objects, ingress, okay, and flagger being one of the things that you would use here, once they're in Git, I can audit them, 
I know how to find them. I can review them. I have complete observability into what was going on. And it's reproducible. So while that's not so critical about the red candle and the red candle holder, if you're calculating risk on how you're going to trade a portfolio of a couple hundred million dollars, it becomes a little bit different. And being able to reproduce the situation that produced those trades is absolutely critical in fiscal and financial auditing, especially with all compliance. Okay? Now you look at the toolkits in the machine learning world that are beginning to make waves into other parts of the Kubernetes community. Things like Argo and Selden, okay, Kubeflow, uh, Airflow for building machine learning pipelines. Okay, these tools can all use Git and be GitOps enabled. In fact, most of them are already. So the tooling behind this now becomes standard whether you're writing code for web apps or building out machine learning pipelines. So now, since everything's in Git, from code to data sets to algorithms to Kubernetes objects to deployment, everything is there, it becomes really easy to do progressive delivery. And really all you have to do is say, okay, we have a piece of code with a data set and a model and that's running currently. And so when somebody comes in and says, I bought a red candle holder, they go and ask, hey, this guy bought a red candle holder, what should I recommend? Well, recommend red candles. And so that's operating today. So canary deployment is a, one of the many ways you can do progressive delivery. There are several. Um, the most common one that you'll see is blue green, which is basically traffic shifting. Okay, they have AB, which is smarter traffic shifting, which is based on HTTP requests and cookies, so it keeps a session, so Paul is on A and George is on B, so you can have that kind of intelligence. Um, Canary, which says, I am going to put some portion of the traffic over to the new code and see how it runs. And then I'm gonna put a little more. And then I'm gonna put a little more. Um, and so you can watch it progressively change from the old release to the new release. Uh, everybody, may, maybe not everybody, knows why it's called a canary. So after this, go look up canary in a coal mine. And you'll understand that what this was is they brought canaries into the coal mine to, when the oxygen ran out, the canary died first, so the men got out. That's why they did this. So anyway, a canary deployment basically is progressively going from version one to version two. And by doing that, you do it progressively by percentage over a certain amount of time, and you put in triggers or thresholds. And the thresholds basically say that if I will continue to progressively increase the traffic to version two over time unless one of these things happens. And that could be something as simple as the request takes too long or the model doesn't respond or actually in data science, when you look at some of the machine learning, the correlation factors and things like that can be measured and used to stop a canary from going to 100%. So you can actually use things that are specific to your machine learning model to do this. Now, this is obviously something you wanna test, and this is it, the final way of doing the test. But you can use progressive delivery on test data as well. You don't necessarily have to do this on a live system. So it can be used in both a test environment and in live, but typically they're used in a live production environment. So when you look at the whole pipeline from beginning to end, what you see is you have all of the things uh, feeding into Git. So you have the deployment. The deployment includes data, models, code. You have the canary because you actually have to tell it how to do the progressive delivery and how your applications are deployed, which may very well be Helm. It could be a Helm chart. It may be straight manifests as well. 
So when you commit, it goes to Flux. Flux says, hey, look, we've got to pull these images. And what happens is, is that you now have two of your application running side by side where Flagger is redirecting traffic or redirecting requests from the old release to the new release. In other words, as every request comes in, Flagger decides and tells the service mesh, go left or go right, go to the old release or the new release. In the beginning, everything goes to the old release or version one. You then tell Flagger <clears throat> over time how to add more traffic from one to the other. So I'm gonna stop by C. Uh, yeah, I don't know if when's a good time to pause, but we have. So this is actually a good time right now. Okay. Uh, so someone was wondering, um, reinforcement learning is it implemented with it, with this process? Um, actually, that's a new term for me. Uh, can you explain what that is? Okay. So reinforced learning. The idea is is that as the model is executed or in production, what it does and the recommendations it makes let's say if we're doing our, our recommendation model, are then fed back to the model. So in essence, it learns as it's learning. So it's a learning model. In other words, yeah, if I just train the model and say, here's the data set, here's the training, go, right? That, that training remains static until I release a new model. Okay, reinforce says some, it's a feedback loop. So. The thing you have to be aware of for reinforcement, right? In this particular um, method of moving from yesterday's model to today's model, the application is what's gonna be doing the reinforcement, okay? Flagger's just doing the traffic. It's making it easy. However, one of the things that comes out of reinforcement learning is metrics about how that is happening and how well that is happening. Those could be the triggers that stop version two, the new version of the model, from being 100% deployed. So is it specific? Is there something specific that helps reinforce learning? No. But you can use things that you get during reinforced learning, such as correlation, and use that to, tr to stop the model from being deployed. So as we go a little farther, you'll see what I mean. So Thank you. in okay, so in essence, what you're gonna do here, and so we can talk about it in reinforced learning. What you can do here is you set an interval that says, I am going to only every certain amount of time I'm going to progress this amount of percentage up to this. So in this particular uh instance in this particular configuration it says every minute i'm going to step five percent more traffic to the new version up to fifty percent all right now if you were going to switch all the way over the part that says max weight would be a hundred percent the time interval would be whatever you want it to be and the step is might be smaller so if you want a very slow progression the interval would be longer and the step weight would be smaller Okay, in this particular case, what's happening here is this canary is going to split half and half, this particular configuration. The benefit here is, is that you can now actually watch these models side by side. So if you don't want to do that, you'd set the percentage max weight to 100, let's say. The other thing is, I mentioned, what, how, how do you get this to roll back? Well, in the old world, if the model began to go south, somebody actually would have to push out the old code, the old model, and the old algorithms, and everything would have to get reset up, and then the traffic directed to it. The benefit here of using progressive delivery is that you have two of them running side by side, which means that we can automate a rollback very simply. So how do you do that? So we talked about thresholds and triggers. The things that cause the thresholds and triggers to start a rollback are completely controlled by you. 
and they can use any metric. Any metric that your application provides, for example, in the case of reinforced learning is a good example. If you begin to see errors in, you may want to say, okay, go back to yesterday's model, okay? Code errors, latency, time lag, um, request length. There's a lot of things that you can monitor and anything, any Prometheus metric that the application or the service mesh produces can be used to stop the progressive delivery and roll it back. So we'll use this particular one uh, that's as an example. So it says that if the level go, if the number of bad requests goes below, a uh, good request goes below 99%, in one minute time interval, I'm gonna roll back. So that means if I have two bad requests within a minute, it's gonna roll it back, as an example. The second one says, oh, let's look at how long it takes. If any request is over a half a second in duration, meaning the latency is 500 milliseconds or more, in any 30 second interval, roll it back. Now, as a data scientist, you can begin to see if I can capture the metric, it could be anything, especially in reinforced learning. You may want to look at correlation. You may want to look at hit rate. You may want to look at, you know, hey, actually anything at that point. Hit rate's probably the easiest. It's like if you're reinforcing the learning and the match rate is going down, you're probably not learning much you're probably doing negative learning and maybe that's not such a good thing. So this gives you the ability to do that. But I'm gonna go back one slide for a second. The schedule interval, which here is set to a minute, this was a test, okay? That means we're gonna go from zero to 100% in one minute. It's not a realistic thing. You'd probably do this over a fairly lengthy period of time, meaning, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, half hour, depending on what your traffic volume is and how often your model gets tested, okay? You know, how many requests are made of it. You may, may be five minutes, might be 10 minutes, might be 15, but you gotta give it enough time and especially in reinforced learning, give it enough requests to ensure that it's learning well and not learning badly. Because the last thing you wanna do is have the guy from yesterday who, bought the red candlestick. We recommended a red candle today because it learned somewhere some bad data or anomalous data got in there and it's serving them blue cows. And that's not what we wanna do. So in, in the sense that you have this control over how this progression works. The last thing I wanna point out here is this configuration is GitOps enabled which means that Flagger will go and look for a change in the configuration. And so you can change this on the fly, number one. And number two, it means that you now have a completely automated way to do this. In other words, I don't wanna be up at 2 a.m. when I switch the models over. I want it to do it for me and make some intelligent decisions on whether it did it or not. And when I come in at nine o'clock the next morning, I'm gonna find out that, hey, the model didn't deploy because we had too many errors or the learn rate was bad or the, the hit rate was low or the match percentage was too low. Whatever it is you use to judge the quality of it, you'll be able to see the next morning. So Flagger logs everything and as well as the fact that you have Git telling you what the thresholds and metrics and parametrics were for your model, it'll be very obvious, hopefully, and easy to fix. So I don't really have much else. Um, hey, is this a good point to pause? Because someone had a yep. question on your previous diagram. Okay, so, hang on. Okay, so you want a progressive progression. 
Um, well, let's let's read the uh, <laughs> the question first, and if you can yeah. go back to the diagram. And the question was, um, I'm a little confused um, by the position of ingress in the diagram that you have. Um, I thought the ingress controller needs to work with flagger and flux. So can we go back to the diagram? To this one? I believe that's, um, yeah, let us know if that's what you're referring to. The position of ingress in this model feels confusing. Because I guess it's coming from the right and it's pointing to it's right, it's pointing to the canary. What, what's missing in this diagram is the service mesh. Okay, so the canary doesn't actually talk to the ingress controllers or the ingress objects. It's actually talking to the service mesh. And the service mesh is what's controlling the ingress itself. Okay, so remember the service mesh, as I said at the beginning, is an overlay on top of whatever networking you already have. And that includes all of the ingresses. Does that answer the question? Let us know. Before Let us know. While, while we're waiting, we have another question, um, which is asking, okay. oh, yes, it does. Okay, glad, okay. glad we answered your question. So the other question is, um, I guess, around flagger, like how fancy can you make this progression screen? Like, can you do as incremental as 1%, 5%, 10%, 25%, 50%, then 100%? So as far as I know, it's, it, the granularity is a single percentage, and it is linear. Okay. Um, that one, the, we could pass on to Stefan and see if he'd be interested in doing that. Um, my question would be is, why would you want to have it progressively pick up speed over time? When, uh, that would kind of worry me. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to split up this question. So the first question is, you know, who maintains Flagger product projects? So as he was just mentioning, um, Stefan Pradhan is on our developer experience team. He's the person who created Flagger. Um, being in the Kubernetes community and seeing this need, um, it has taken off. And in fact, uh, quite secretly, someone was just uh, telling us secretly that they were um, preparing for a conference. They're like, oh my God, there's so many talks on Flagger. There's almost too many talks on Flagger that they had to sort of figure things out. So that's very exciting to hear. Um, so uh, we'll be sharing by email in the end as well. If you haven't joined our Slack channel, um, we do have a, a channel for Flagger if you um, start using it and you have questions. So um, that is something that comes directly from Weaveworks. Uh, now the second part of the question is, um, are you suggesting Spinnaker for canary analysis? So that's up to you. Um, in the case of using Flagger, uh, the statistics are actually logged. So Flagger keeps track of what's going on as far as traffic and rate. But also, depending on which service mesh you use, all right, uh, let's use, we'll take Istio. Istio allows you to graphically watch what's happening. So you can actually see what changed over time. Flagger logs that data and also Flagger ha provides Prometheus metrics on its own that monitors how the progression went. So you have two choices there. Um, could you use Spinnaker to do this? I suppose, but it's kind of counterproductive since any thing that can monitor the Prometheus metrics, you could actually build Grafana dashboards to do this in its most simple form. Um, cool. um, and so, yeah, this person sort of followed up saying, I can share use cases for why progression can be speeded up over time. Um, basically, my confidence in the product model increases. So I guess it's a little bit more of a comment. Okay. And yeah, I could, I could see that. That would assume a long schedule interval, though. I mean, you know, you're not going to do that over an hour. You might do that over a couple of hours where over time it says, okay, you know, okay, I'm good with it. And in the last hour where the step interval goes up from 1% to 10% or 15%. Understood. Yeah. Um, and so I actually just shared in the chat. Yeah. If any of you um, are here because you're hoping that this methodology um, will solve your problems. Yeah. Please share with us, uh, you know, what, what you're looking for and we'd like to help. This is all our open source stuff. And so, um, yeah, if anybody can help, please let us know what you're looking to um, solve in your particular use cases. Um, so the next one, very long. Okay. Do you have any experience applying GitOps to the automated CD methods? Um, that you have, for example, the results from a V1 model to help learn a V2 model, um, for example, um, via reinforcement learning or similar. Uh, 
And when confidence is high enough, start rolling over from V2 to start learning V3. So yeah, I guess it's this progressive V1 to V2 to V3. How would that work with the GitOps? So the way you would approach this in GitOps is, is that the V, let's assume that your model does two things. One, it answers requests. So, you know, somebody asks the model for uh, you know, whatever, a prediction. And at the time that the prediction is done, that you're basically adding that request and its resulting scoring to another data set or additional training data set for the next day. Okay, so in the GitOps model, the thing that makes this simple is, is that you control it. The part that we don't control is the fact that the reinforcement learning is actually going on in the application. So in the world where you wanna keep both data sets, the V1 training set and the V2 set that is being provided while V2 is running or V1 is running, in either case, you could do this in Git if your data sets are small enough. However, if your data sets are huge, Git's really not gonna be a good chance for that, in which case you're gonna have to look for something else in the storage layer to do it. But how you actually snapshot it and train against it, or if it's interactive training, how would you do that? Hmm. Well, if it's interactive training, it's reinforcement training, the model is going to be changing on the fly. At the point at which you start the progression from V1 to V2, you're going to have to, you'd have to do the commit at some point and say, okay, this is the data set I'm going to use for V2 going forward. And then obviously, the minute V2 comes online, it's going to be, begin to send data to train for V3. So yeah, this would be a little more convoluted process and we'd need some help at the application level to pull that off. Okay. Yeah, um, but I definitely understand what you're asking there. And a second part to that question was having the models auto uh, autonomously learn can be risky. So having auto automated checkpoints in accountable states seems promising. Right, so in a case where you're doing reinforcement learning, your interval's gonna wanna be real long. Okay, because the risk of this thing going haywire won't be visible probably in the first small sample set. So as the number of uh, predictions gets bigger and the sample set, the reinforced sample set gets larger, the chances of having the model go, you know, the predictions go bad or the hit rate go out or whatever it is that you're monitoring is gonna be over time. So yeah, that I understand. Um, so one question was, you know, is there a flagger integration with Weave Cloud? So I just put in the chat. Um, yes, there is. It's behind yes, a feature is. flag that we've been fighting for. So in fact, if you come and say, I want flagger and Weave Cloud, we can finally say, okay, let's, um, you know, it is actually kind of sort of on the roadmap. We've kind of been lobbying for it. But yes, this is really what we want. If people say, yes, we want this. Yeah, it is there. We can so, yes. kind of get the UI. They say it's about a 60-day process that they put full time. They just want to make sure that, you know, the user experience and the UI is well done. But yes, if you want that, please let us know. That would be exciting for us. Um, let me see. I think I read that one. Um, is there an example on GitHub for the proposed model in this webinar that I can check out and build from? Um, oh, uh, are you talking about an actual sample uh, data set and model and code? No, I didn't put one together. Okay, okay so but actually, idea. yeah, actually any small recommendation model is probably the simplest to use. Um, and I will dig one up, but basically, yeah, you want a model small enough to where you can use GitOps to do the whole thing. Yeah, so like a simple whole yeah. model. Yeah. Yeah, we can, um, that's a good Understood. Just to see how it should be done. Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so in fact, this is our very first time presenting on this topic because Paul is uh, fairly new and uh, we've been very excited that he has this knowledge and so we can finally like kind of move forward, especially with great machine learning uh, messaging and content. So you guys are the first. So thanks for this feedback, that's very helpful. 
Um, we're getting on about 45 minutes, but are there any last questions or comments, or as I mentioned, any problems that you're looking to solve that you're hoping this may or may not solve, but you still are not sure? Uh, let us know. Uh, in the meantime, um, okay, so someone has asked, speaking about size troubles, does Weave Cloud support other data layers than Git uh, or the other than different cloud providers, say S3 or similar? So it's, so it's part of GitOps, no. Okay, so this is this is going to be that point where you're going to have to make a decision on where, I mean, your code can be in Git, that's easy. And small models can be in Git, uh, big models probably won't do well in Git. Okay, especially if it's remote to wherever you're running uh, your application. In that case, you know, this is the big data problem again where you get back to saying, how do I snapshot the data and how do I snapshot my models so that I can revert it? So when you look at the one of my prior drawings, in fact, let me step back. Uh, I separated very specifically um, the data scientist from the data engineer. Now, they may be the same person and depending on how big your data set and your models are, you potentially could do that. But yeah, this is, this is a problem that has to get worked out with the data science community and figure out which one of the Kubernetes storage platforms is going to be best. But yeah, I don't have a concrete answer because everyone's going to be different. Excellent. All right, thanks everyone. Um, I'm going to switch back. And just quickly, because letting you know before you guys go, we're um, putting out these uh, longer workshops on these topics, which Paul will be running. And uh, we're going to start out in the New York, uh, Boston area. So if any of you are out there or know people out there who are interested, uh, let us know. I'm going to skip ahead here. So we have this workshop, but we'll uh, follow up and, you know, fill it out and uh, let us know your interest and where you are. And we'll start trying to put that on our calendar. And uh, Sorry, Stacy, if you could check the chat. I just noticed there is a chat. Uh, and going back also, like I said, if, it's your, if this is your first time joining our Weave Online user group, thanks for coming. Uh, usually we have these series on Tuesdays, so um, we have a variety of talks still coming up through the end of the year, aside from the holidays. Our best source of truth is our meetup page here, uh, which we'll also email to you. So if you're looking for future talks or you'd like to request future talks, uh, please go ahead and send me a comment there or you can email me, which I'll also include in the email. Um, and again, uh, we have our Slack channel. If you have follow-up questions, Paul and I and everybody are there on the WeWorks team, um, especially if you're interested in this uh, MLOps uh, topic or if you wanna come to MLOps workshop. These are the various ways you can let us know and uh, we'll also include it in the email. Um, I see that it is blinking, so I just want to make sure. Are there any last questions here? Oh, there is a quick question. Uh, yes, there are going to be video recordings. We record all of our videos, and Stacy has posted our channel there. So we have our playlist of all these talks. So with that, there's not any last things. Thank you so much for your time and coming and uh, asking your questions. Again, we are here to help solve your problems. So um, we've, we'll take your feedback around product and around sample apps and all that. And uh, we'll be providing more of this info. So thanks again, Paul, for speaking. That was fantastic. Thanks for your questions. And thanks for Stacy for organizing. Yeah. We'll see thanks you all Thanks for the questions. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.